and Luke, uh, after writing the gospel, was compelled uh, by the expression of the early church to also write a historical record of how did those who actually walked with Jesus and heard the words of Jesus, how did they take this message and actually make it live in a world that was not very uh, friendly to the message of Jesus. And the Acts of the Apostle then is the first kind of generation of all the disciples, their work and how they started the Jesus revolution. And I don't know about you, but we're living in a world now where uh, the ways of Jesus may not always be that friendly to folk, but we're still called to initiate this Jesus revolution. Amen. Amen. So we've been going through a sermon series all summer long on the revolutionary uh, life of Jesus and how we ourselves are called to live this revolutionary life out. And uh, we'll take a few moments to uh, uh, start here in this passage and then do some preaching on uh, this revolutionary living series. And uh, following that, we will take some time and remember uh, the Lord's uh, sacrifice to us through our communion um, discipline. When you have uh, Acts chapter 15, verse number one, somebody say, I got it. All right, we will start at verse number one, and we'll read all the way uh, through till the, uh, say, verse number uh, 12. In the words of Scripture, I'm reading from the Message Version, so it may be a little different than your version, uh, but it is all, uh, you know, expressing and saying much of the same thing, so feel free to uh, follow along, or you can certainly listen to how uh, this version reads. Uh, now, uh, the background again of this is uh, they are in a city called Antioch, and Antioch is uh, kind of the, the place where uh, these disciples are. So we pick up verse number one, and it wasn't long before some of the Jews showed up. I will enter to Antioch. They showed up in Antioch from Judea, insisting that everyone be circumcised. If you're not circumcised in the Mosaic fashion, you can't be saved, is what they would say. But Paul and Barnabas were up on their feet at once in fierce protest. The church decided to resolve the matter by sending Paul, Barnabas, and a few others to put it before the apostles and leaders in Jerusalem. After they were sent off and on their way, they told everyone they met as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria about the breakthrough to the Gentile outsiders. Somebody say outsiders. And everyone who heard the news cheered, for it was terrific news. And when they got to Jerusalem, Paul and Barnabas were graciously received by the whole church, including the apostles and the leaders. And they reported on their recent journey and how God had used them to open things up to the outsiders. There goes that word again. And some Pharisees stood up to say their peace. For they had become believers, but continued to hold to the party line of the Pharisees. Now, this is something, right? Because these Pharisees were the very same folk that killed Jesus. Now, ain't it something? Jesus must have had some kind of impact on some of these folk that you killed them one day and the next day you following him. Uh, Jesus got that kind of lingering aftertaste, praise God. It's hard to get rid of them. But the Pharisees holding on to their party line, they said that you have to circumcise the pagan converts. You must make them keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the leaders called a special meeting to consider the matter. And the arguments went on and on, back and forth, getting more and more heated. Then Peter took the floor. Friends, you know that from early on, God made it quite plain that he had wanted the pagans to hear the message of this good news and embrace it. And not in any secondhand or roundabout way, but firsthand, straight from my mouth. God, who can't be fooled by any pretense on our part, but always knows a person's thoughts, gave them the Holy Spirit just like he gave it to us. He treated the outsiders exactly as he treated us, beginning at the very center of who they were, and working from that center outward, cleaning up their lives as they trusted and believed him. Boy, I tell you, that's some good word. Verse 10 says, so why are you now trying to out-God God? Ain't that a good phrase? 
Amen. I, 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 I could just build everything I'm going to say about trying to out-God God. Tell your neighbor, don't out-God God. Praise God. Why are you trying to out-God God? Loading these new believers down with rules that crushed our ancestors and crushed us too. Don't we believe that we are saved because the Master Jesus amazingly and out of sheer generosity moved to save us just as he did those beyond our nation? So what are we arguing about? There was dead silence. and No one said a word. With the room quiet, Barnabas and Paul reported matter-of-factly on the miracles and wonders God had done among the other nations through their ministry. The word of God for us, the people of God, let us say thanks be to God. So we will speak from the topic, revolutionary series, uh, this revolutionary living series. Today's sermon will simply be make room for God. Make room for God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the word of God that is bereft for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And as I stand to preach and teach your word, please send your anointing. That makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me and even the hearers of this word. In Jesus' name, we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them, make room for God. Make room for God. Make room. Today is uh, our first Sunday, and all of you that have been at the way for a little while know that every first Sunday, we celebrate the sacrament. We celebrate Eucharist. We celebrate communion. We celebrate the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf through the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus being crucified on the cross. It is a concrete reminder to all of us. That God continues to bless us outside of the limitations of our own humanity. That even though there may be lots of things going on in our lives that the sacrament, communion, uh, the Eucharist, our salvation is not accomplished because of some human endeavor. But it is at its very core a supernatural intervention to our ordinary lives. It is a constant reminder that even though things may feel at times out of our control, that God always has a plan inside of his control. And that plan is always working to accomplish our salvation. Now be clear. That once you give your life to Christ or as you are on this journey to give your life to Christ, there are many, many things that will happen in your life that will make you feel like you are out of control. That your life is out of your hands. That through your own knowledge or capacity or skill set, that you have things happening that you cannot necessarily resolve on your own. And when those times come, how many of you know uh, it's easier to kind of resort back into ways of living that you know uh, may make you feel better but don't get you out of the mess you in? Uh, I acted mighty sanctified this morning, praise God. How many of you know that there are a lot of decisions some of us can make that that, 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 that we, we kind of squeeze God out of the margins of our life or out of the center of our life because uh, the thing gets so difficult that we would rather depend on our own plan than making room for God's plan. Tell me, though, God's plan rarely looks like our plan. How many of you know that sometimes you can have a thing all, like, planned out, praise God, and you think you done planned for every contingency, and that one little thing you forgot to account for can be the torpedo that sinks everything you've invested your life in. But when you make room for God, how many of you know there is no loose end that God can't resolve? I wish I had a church in here this morning. You see, sometimes God is, is, is working in our lives in a way that 
seems beyond our ability to ascertain or grasp. Did not the prophet say that God's ways are not our ways and God's thoughts are not our thoughts? That in many ways, sometimes God moves outside of your ability to comprehend. But do I have anybody that can be a witness to say that every time God stepped in, God made everything all right in my life? Now, the question for us, and this is a hard question, is how long are we willing to wait for God to make everything all right? Because if you like me, I need everything all right today. All right, praise God. I don't got a whole lot of time, God. Now, you, you taking your time. Praise God. It's been, it's been 24 hours. I need to like, fix right now. I have a witness in the house. Amen. God, I, all right, I done prayed. I prayed. I prayed and fasted all night long. And that fast, it was hard while I was asleep. Amen. I'm trying to figure out where you at, God. What's taking you so long? <laughs> Woo. God is taking his sweet time. You sitting there like, God, what's up? All right, God, you take too long. Then you try to do it your own self. And then you end up in a worse situation than you was if you just would have waited on God. Tell your neighbor, keep waiting on God. Lord, have mercy. I can look over my life right now, and, and, I, and I wish I would have waited. Anyone have some time? Lord, I wish I would have waited because the mess I'm in today couldn't be no worse than if I would have waited on God. You see, the problem with many of us is we don't create room for God to move. I like to call it the God space. I mean, you got to create some space for God to work. You can't just make everything so tight and so, you know, uh, measured that, that if, it don't, if it don't have any wiggle room, then all of a sudden you feel like God has left you. Well, you want to know what faith is like? Faith is not like those skinny pants a lot of our folks like to wear. Like a, 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 a fitting dress or a, or a tailor-made suit that, that fits every curve of your body. That's not what faith is. Faith is a loose garment that you put on that is always too big for you to wear. And when your faith grows, how many of you know your, 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 the garment grows? And you never grow into full faith, but faith is always a lot bigger than anything that you can really lean into. And part of what that faith must always be for us is the God space. I'm creating space for God to do the impossible. I'm creating space for God to take extraordinary steps to deal with my ordinary situations. And when God enters my God space, how many of you know there's no weapon the enemy can bring in my life that God cannot handle? Give your neighbor a high five and tell him, get that God space, get that God space. Now, now here in the text, we have a very interesting encounter between these early Christians, these early followers of Jesus. Now, you got to understand a couple of things as a point of background that here in this text, they are in the city of Antioch. The city of Antioch is the first church that is known as Christians. Earlier in the book of Acts, all of the Christians were known as followers of the way. And that's where we get our name from, amen. At the beginning of our big church, uh, you know, kind of existence, we thought it'd be great to call ourselves the way. Because that's all we are. We're just trying to follow the way of Jesus. Somebody say amen. Amen. Because how many know you can say Christian and everybody got all kind of interesting things to say about Christians. But, but, you know, we all Christians. I'm not trying to say we ain't Christian. We better than anybody else. But I wanted to make a point to make sure that all of us in here, we're trying to follow the way of Jesus. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them follow the way. Amen. This is the way. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for the way. But here in Antioch, uh, you had these first group of folk, and listen, the, the church in Antioch, interestingly enough, were all of different races, all of different cultures, all from different nations. It was a very eclectic group of people who had made a decision to follow the way of Jesus. But then all of a sudden, people from Jerusalem started to show up, Judea, and they started to show up and they looked around and they saw all this diversity and they saw all this stuff and they were like, wait a minute. That don't look like what we have. 
So since that don't look like what we have, then it must not be real Christianity. In our church, it's only Jewish folk. And we all learned it a certain way, did it a certain way, and I'm coming here, and all of a sudden, everything looked different than us. So they're trying to put on these folk their expression of Christian faith that is actually limiting God or their understanding of what God can do. And how many of you know that you can't put God in a box? It is something that a lot of us are putting, trying to put God in a box when God is trying to take us out of a box. And that is the great challenge, I think, in this moment in time in our country's uh, existence and even in our global existence that we are quickly becoming a society of exclusionary living. That we are creating all these categories, political categories, racial categories, sexuality categories, religious categories, nation state categories, and we're dividing ourselves up in all these groups, excluding, and, and, and let me be clear, every category likes to exclude other people that don't agree with them. Amen. Progressives are just as exclusionary as conservatives. It's very fascinating. I hang around progressive folk, and they are some of the most exclusionary folk you want to meet. And I hang around conservative folk, too, and we know that they got a reputation of being exclusionary. So the human tendency is to push and shun people you don't agree with and embrace those who believe everything you do. But how many of you know that God is way bigger than any one of our little disagreements about each other? And when we come into relationship with God, how many of you know you then are catapulted into relationship with other people that you did not choose? Mm, mm, mm. I know we don't like that. Mm, because I know some folk that I'm like, man, how you end up in my life? Praise God. I didn't ask for you to be here. Go on back from whence you came. And God seemed to just keep them right there. Staring at you in the face, reminding you that it ain't about you. Huh. <laughs> Ooh, Jesus. Don't you know that when any of us begin to elevate these social identities above our spiritual heritage in Christ, that we have officially entered into idolatry? That there is no human category that should trump our life in Christ. And part of what is happening in this story, in this record of the early church, is that there were people showing up into this multicultural, multiracial, diverse community trying to put on them a very narrow vision of what it means to follow God. And when you can't make room for God to transcend your narrow vision, then you are dangerously entering into rarefied air. If the air is so thin where you're trying to go that you won't stay there very long. Because how many know there's only one throne? And there's only one God who sits on that throne. And if God has accepted some folk, who are you to say that they cannot be in the family of God? So in many ways, particularly among the church in this text and many in our lives, this always becomes a conversation about who belongs and who does not. It becomes a conversation about who fits in and who stands outside. It's a conversation at the end of the day about power. How do we use our power to uh, include people or exclude folk, to diminish folk humanity or amplify the truth that we all have been created in the image of God. And this image affords us dignity even when I don't agree with your life. Now, I tell folk all the time when I'm traveling on the road that nobody should be defined by the worst thing they've done in their life. But ain't it something that when we get into the place and the space where God has included us, we are easily able to try to exclude somebody else. So part of what the following of Jesus requires, if you're going to live revolutionary, is you must create space in every part of your life 
for God to do a miracle in the lives of people who you think should not be where you are. Because how many know when anyone enters into the God space, you can't stay the same living in the God space. Your life is changed when you start to interact with God. Now, interacting with me, you may get worse, praise God, depending on what day of the week you call me. And you call me on a bad day, and be like, man, I don't know why I talked to Pastor Mike today. He's on one. It's like, yeah, I sure was, praise God. How I many know when you enter into the God space, God will always make your life transformed into the image of his son. To be like Jesus. To be like him. Oh, how I want to be like him. So meek and lowly. So humble and holy. How I want to be like him. That was an old school song. Some of y'all are like, what are you talking about? He's, he's Pastor Freestyler, praise God. Yeah, I'm freestyling a, a old school song. Tell your neighbor, I want to be like him. Amen. And that is the God space that you and I must be open to engaging. And child of God, when you and I enter this God space, when we create this space for God to move, then God can do the impossible in our lives. But when there is no God space and you push God out and you only try to do it according to your own thinking and ways, how many of you know you aren't smart enough to fix your problems, much less anybody else's? Uh. I know we here in Berkeley, praise God, in Oakland, and everybody here is the jack of all trades. But tell your neighbor, you still ain't the master of not one thing, praise God. And that's why you need the God space. Make room for God to surprise you. Make room for God to heal you. Make room for God to hold you. Whatever you do, don't be like the Pharisees in this story. Make room for God. Somebody shout hallelujah. So there are a few ways then that I'll lift up in this text that I think are critical for us if we're going to make room for God. One of the first things that are required is that we must learn to stress relationship over rules. Somebody say relationship over rules. Say it again, relationship over rules. Now, it is clear that the paradigm of the Jewish religious tradition has mostly been about creating rules that create holiness or right living before God. And it was pretty much summarized in this idea or this practice that was known as circumcision. Now, circumcision, many of us may know uh, or be familiar with this, is a practice where uh, the, the, the baby, uh, the male baby of a Jewish family had to get his foreskin removed from his penis at his, you know, couple weeks into his life. And, and every Jewish male had to undergo this practice in order to be included or in order to be an authentic Jewish child. Now, it is fascinating that when you a baby, you don't remember that it happened. Amen. I mean, I don't remember that, you know, that happened to me. I know it happened, praise God. I just don't remember it. Uh, and, 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 and it's fascinating that in this story, you got a bunch of adult men called Pharisees who have had this experience in a part of their life they can't remember, but are now showing up to other adults who have not had this very painful uh, practice, and they're telling them, you got to get it done in order to follow Jesus. Folk putting rules on others that they themselves would not be able to keep in their own kind of present life. How many of you know that it is easy to ask other folk to do stuff you yourself don't have to do? And then get real self-righteous about it, right? Oh, I can't believe they can't stop this. And I can't believe they can't stop that. And 
that ain't your struggle, so it, you, of course you can't believe it. Praise God. <laughs> that ain't your struggle. But let, let, just give me a few moments, and I bet you I can get a few I can't believe statements going on in your life. Somebody say amen. That God is not depending on rules as a prerequisite for relationship with him. But rather, God believes and demonstrates through even his own life that I will come down and live with you, engage with you, dwell with you, and out of this relationship, your life will be transformed. Here you find then that this practice of circumcision, the difficulty of it, easily became synonymous with the law. And how many commandments, many of us Bible students in here, how many commandments were given to the children of Israel on the Mount Sinai? Anybody know? Anybody know? Ten commandments. Ain't that something? How many heard the ten commandments before? Amen. All right. There you go. All right. So all of us Bible students in here. And, but how many of you know that after uh, a couple hundred years, the ten commandments became 612? Yeah, ain't it something God will give you 10 things, and by the time you, we get a hold of it, it'll turn into 600 and something? God tells you to love everybody, and you got 612 different ways to interpret that. Mm, love somebody if, or love somebody when, or love somebody how. It's like, wait, just love them. That's what happens when rules trump relationships. Because how many of you know when you're in a relationship with somebody, uh, there ain't enough rules to tell you how to keep that relationship going. There are certain things that my wife, thank God, amen, hi baby, praise God. Uh, there are certain things that, that my wife uh, uh, does to me and I do to her that are not written down on paper. But it is growing out of our relationship. And there are certain ways of living and engaging with folk that rules will not be able to exhaust. But the longer and the deeper you get in relationship with folk, then you will find that lives begin to change. And if there's one thing we must master as followers of Jesus is we must learn how to be in deep relationship with one another. That we must not become so constrained by rules and by ideas and thoughts that we forget that the transformation happens when we get close to one another in relationship. And this is why the Holy Spirit has been given to you and I, because the Holy Spirit is that relational conduit. It is that relational pipeline that allows us to be in relationship with God, a relationship of reciprocity where God loves us and then we in turn learn to love God. And there ain't no rules that can be given to you that can teach you how to love God. But you learn to love God the more God loves you. And how many know the more God loves you, then it's easier to love God back. And when God loves you, that old song becomes true. That's something on the inside begins to work its way to the outside, and then you have a magnificent transformation in your life. So the evidence of your relationship is not manifested in how many rules you keep, but how much your life is being transformed into the ways of Jesus. And here in this text, you see clearly, we all see clearly, that you had a bunch of folk who were trying to put rules over relationship. And if you're going to live in a revolutionary way, countercultural to the ways of this world, it will be to the extent of your relationships with other people. Isn't it fascinating that in this age of excessive communication tools, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, telephones, emails, your mouth, praise God, that we still don't know how to be in relationship with other people. We don't know how to talk to folk. We don't, we, just look at the person next to you, just stare at them in the eyes, watch how uncomfortable you get getting, right? We just like, man, you gotta get out of my space, praise God. You know, it's like, what's going on around here, right? 
But it would be revolutionary if all of us in here, in the middle of all of our diversity and difference, went deep with one another in relationship. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them relationships, relationships, relationships. That's what God is looking for. And the thing I'll lift up before we transition into this next moment of worship and communion, the text says in verse number eight that God, who can't be fooled by pretense on our part but knows the person's thoughts, he treated them just like us, the outsiders. Verse 10, so why are you now trying to out-God God? God? I think the last thing you have to realize is if we are going to live revolutionary, you have to get off our high horses. Some of us are trying to be harder than God. Some of us are trying to out-God God. Tell your neighbor, don't out-God God. Amen. What does that mean? Don't, don't, don't presume. Pastor Don, I think, was talking about this a couple weeks ago, last week. Amen. How many of us can be around folk who who claim to know everything about God, like they got a corner on God. Anybody ever met anybody like that? Like, I, man, I, it may be, you know, I don't know. I'm not going to start naming no names. But, you know, people are like, oh, I know exactly what God is saying all the time. And, you know, God, God can't surprise you because you're just in touch with God. Well, that means you have not created space for God. And I never want to be in a position in my life where God can't surprise me. Where God can't slip in a good one on me. Be like, whoa, man, that was, whew, God, that was a good one. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for that. I appreciate that, right? Because how many of you know when, when you think you figure God out, then, then, then you have pretty much uh, created space or a way of living where there is no space for God to do anything. And when you are that rigid, you are that rigid towards other people. You're that rigid towards that. When, when you can't be surprised by God, then you don't create any space for anyone else to grow or be surprised by God, too. Ain't it something that God will spend our whole life trying to get us right? But you and I can't walk with folk that long. You know, we got friends for seasons, right? You know, well, you was my friend in uh, uh, April, praise God, but that season is over. So I, uh, and I got my summer friends, I got my winter friends. All right, let me, let me expand that. Yeah, I got my high school friends, all right? And I got my, and I, 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 I get that because, you know, there are some limitations we have as human beings, but ain't it a blessing that God can look at our whole life and God can make sure that whatever we need done to be in relationship with God, God is not ran off by us. So if God's not run off by us, then what does it mean for us as the church to not run off other folk? What does it mean for you and your family to not be so quick to give that person in your family who don't fit your family's reputation? You know how we got them folk, right? Ooh, you show a bad blight on our family's name. So I'm going to put you over here in the corner. I'm, I'm not going to tell anybody that, you know, you're part of our family. It's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. What if God treated us that way? What if God, like, mm, man, you show us an embarrassment to me and my, my angelic host, praise God. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? God sitting up in heaven, God like, McBride, you really let me down today. You're out. Boom. Hit the road, Jack, like Martin. You know, and you all remember when Martin used to get upset? And, you know, folks get on his nerve. He's like, okay, okay, get the stepping. You remember he opened up the door? And, you, know, you know, can you imagine if God started to actually do this to us? Hey, man, can you imagine what kind of, what would happen in our life if God was like, get to stepping, get away from me, and don't ever come back? If God is willing to walk with us, don't you out-God God. Don't you be so quick to exclude God, folk that God is willing to spend eternity with. That's why I can't wait to get to heaven because I know there's going to be some folk up there. Some of us going to be like, whoo, that was a good one, God. I mean, this is, what a surprise, surprise, surprise. And my prayer is that me being there will be the biggest surprise of all. Somebody say amen. And that better be your prayer too. Don't you? 
Folks say, God got my God got my room on reserved. Well, it ain't because of you. Because of grace and mercy. And I am convinced that God is willing to walk with us because God knows our whole story. God knows at the age of six you were molested. So God knows, man, that, that, that's going to take a while for you to, to get through. God knows at the age of 13 your family went through a divorce and now you 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 still trying to process through the pain of that 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 difficulty and emotional hardship. God knows at the age of 16, 17, you 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 entered into that relationship that crushed your spirit and and caused you to 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 not trust and 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 you entered into all kind of promiscuity and all kind of things and and you're still trying to figure out what does it mean to be loved. So so and God knows at the age of 25 and 30 your your marriage or your family broke apart and or your finances got so God can see every part of your life like one picture. And that's why God ain't so quick to give up on folk. Cuz God knows the hardship you had to deal with. But God also knows that I can, if you create that God space, God knows I can enter into that space and make everything work out for your good. It is indeed the case, child of God, that making room for God must be one of the most important decisions we make this week. You're going to be tempted to try to out-God God in your relationships, in how you handle things. You're going to be tempted to push God out. Say, God, I got this. I promise, just a, a good little cussing out will just make all of this better. Mm-hmm. A little puff puff of the past will make all of this better. You know? A little this and a little that will make all of this better, and you won't maintain the God space. But before you make some decisions this week, I want to challenge you to ask yourself, am I trying to out-God God? Or am I going to maintain this God space? This space of opportunity for God to move. This space of God being able to surprise me. This space where God can do the supernatural in my life. And if you can maintain the God space, you always have a space for a miracle. And I know we all educated these days and we don't think miracles still happen. Um, but I think I got a few witnesses in here who can just say, I don't know how, but I know who. <laughs> Amen. And it wasn't me. It wasn't my degree. It wasn't my slickness. It wasn't my money. It wasn't my intellect. It wasn't my physical prowess. It, it was God. And if God can do anything but fail, tell your neighbor, you need some God space. Make room for God. If you make room for God, victory shall be ours. Let's stand to our feet, everyone, as we prepare.